everyone. Uh, my name is Adeshewa Adesiji. I'm the Metro Area Workforce Strategy Consultant with the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development, uh, DEED for short. I would like to welcome all of you to our second one-on-one -on -one conversation with DEED's Workforce Strategy Consultant. So Governor Walz has proclaimed October as Manufacturing Month here in Minnesota. Uh, during this month, a spotlight is put on the manufacturing industry and the critical importance of manufacturing to the state's economy and to highlight many career opportunities in this vital industry. Uh, during this month, employers are encouraged to open their doors to Minnesota's youth and residents to explore the possibility of a career in manufacturing. So here's some uh, facts about Minnesota's manufacturing industry. In 2022, manufacturing provided almost 325,000 jobs in Minnesota. That's 11.3% of overall statewide employment. Workers in manufacturing took home $24.9 billion in wages, the second largest total payroll among private sector industries. Between 2021 and 2022, Minnesota added more than 10,000 manufacturing jobs, and the manufacturing industry set a new record with nearly 19,000 job vacancies in 2022. The average number of wages for workers in manufacturing are around $76,950, 10% higher than across all industries in Minnesota. Uh, many more employment opportunities in the sector are projected to open in the upcoming years. In fact, Minnesota is expected to see more than 75,000 job openings for manufacturing production positions alone through 2030. And there are a total of 8,548 manufacturing establish establishments, um, the average, in 2022. So recently, the semiconductor sector has been a topic of discussion. With Congress approving investments in domestic semiconductor manufacturing, research, and design, the CHIPS Act, which stands for Creating Helpful Incentives to Produce Semiconductors uh, of 22, is giving states the possibility to become the top producer of chip manufacturing for everything from everyday use or for everyday use uh, from cell phones, smartphones, vehicles, uh, electronics that we use every day to national defense. So here are some facts about the semiconductor industry in Minnesota. Uh, there are 148 establishments providing almost 10,700 jobs in semiconductor and other electronic component manufacturing subsectors in the first quarter of 2023. The average annual wage were closing in on 83,000 in 2022, which is 19% higher than the total of all industries. Over the past 10 years, Minnesota has added over 1,700 jobs in semiconductor manufacturing, a 19.2% increase. About two thirds or 66.8% of these jobs are in the Twin Cities metro area, which about 15% in Southeast and 11% in Southwest, and the remaining 7% spread across Northeast at 3.2%, Central Minnesota at 2.7%, and Northeast uh, Minnesota region at 0.7 percent. So for this, you know, I wanted to have a conversation about the semiconductor industry. However, I wanted to look at the educational aspect of it. You know, who are those preparing the workforce for this industry? Where do manufacturers go to to prepare new and incumbent workers for these positions? So with that, I would like to introduce to the audience Travis Troll, Senior Fellow and Director of Operations at the University of Minnesota Technological Leadership Institute, or TEI for short. I've had an opportunity to first interact with Travis when I was referred, uh, when I referred an employer uh, looking to upskill their workers. Since then, our paths have, cro have crossed several times, all positive, <laughs> um, of course. So thank you, Travis, for taking time out of your busy schedule to share your expertise piece on the semiconductor industry here in Minnesota. Uh, before we get into the interview, if you, you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself, that'd be great. Yeah, well, I, I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. Uh, as mentioned, Senior Fellow uh, and Director of Operations at the Technological Leadership Institute here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, it's a pleasure to serve in this capacity, bridging uh, higher education, industry, and professional development. 
uh, we have a great mission here to continue Minnesota's uh, economic competitiveness uh, and, and grow all of these great uh, uh, industries. Um, so for those unaware of what the semiconductor industry is, can you tell us a little bit about it in your own words? Yeah, so the semiconductor industry spans everything from the silicon um, uh, uh, development, so building the, the silicon blocks that are, that are made uh, to be the foundations of little tiny microchips uh, through building uh, micro electromechanical devices, so little tiny accelerometers and uh, uh, components that would go into your cell phone, all the way up to the packaging. So uh, typically you don't see a, uh, a semiconductor necessarily when you look inside of a computer, you see the uh, plastic packaging around it on top of the uh, overarching circuit board. So the, the great news is, is Minnesota really encompasses a huge swath of that entire a semiconductor manufacturing pipeline. And it's our goal to make sure that that entire uh, ecosystem has the human capital it needs to be successful and grow. Nice. So, you know, I read somewhere that manufacturing uh, semiconductors for a while was stagnant. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't, you know, a focus for the U.S. So why now? You know, what's the what's driving this industry and the need um, for manu to manufacture this product? You know, why are semiconductors in such high demand? Yeah, so what's really amazing is the United States invented uh, semiconductor technology. We were the pioneers, you know, er everything from the first diode all the way up to the first calculator into uh, microchips and the uh, processors that run your computers. You know, that is Minnesota and the United States heritage uh, to the world. Uh, what happened over the last 30 years in the semiconductor industry mirrors a lot of what happened throughout uh, the greater manufacturing ecosystem in the United States. Uh, we saw diversification of manufacturing processes, not, not only in uh, semiconductor, uh, but also in other types of uh, uh, high-tech manufacturing and uh, uh, traditional manufacturing. So you would see maybe the, the more um, foundational semiconductor processes taking place in countries uh, like South Korea or Taiwan, Japan, and China, where maybe previously they had run in places like Texas, Minnesota, and California. So we, we saw this diversification of the industry. We also saw some of the really great corporations that had traditionally built these semiconductors. You know, IBM, which once had, I think, 12,000 employees in Minnesota, um, start spinning off the fabrication processes to corporations such as Global Foundries. So they become what's called fabless. They do the design and engineering, but then the manufacturing is, is spun off by these third parties, almost like separating the, the peanut butter and jelly from a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Uh, and oftentimes we would keep the peanut butter, but the jelly would go elsewhere. Uh, so we, we saw that take place over the last 30 or 40 years, which you know has pros and cons. But the end state of that was the United States lost its position in that manufacturing world, which had second order effects in the engineering world. And then when the pandemic hit, we really saw that when those supply chains are disrupted, we might be doing that engineering and design here, but if we want those microchips, even if they are you know, traditional or legacy type models, they're being built across the Pacific Ocean. So when we wanna manufacture the next Ford or Tesla, that's great, we can get a good amount of it put together, but if it doesn't have those microchips from Taiwan or South Korea or Japan or China, it's not going anywhere. So these microchips, these semiconductors, which are critical to the technologies that underpin modern life and which used to be really built here in the United States are now being built elsewhere that, that then has those impacts that it holds our economy in a position that we are really dependent upon these other players, which has a multitude of effects, some of them which inhibit our ability to be as innovative and successful and economically viable in the long run. So the CHIPS Act is a great tool in saying, hey, we want to put that peanut butter and jelly back together. We want to have that whole sandwich here in the United States, because if we can make that whole sandwich here, we can feed a lot more people and it probably tastes a lot better. You know, I, I, I have to say before I go to the next question, I love the using the peanut butter and jelly sandwich analogy. And, and I think that that makes sense. You know, you want, you know, we want to make the peanut butter and jelly sandwich here, and we know that we can make the best peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So, I mean, it is a great way to, to put it, and I think it, it makes it better to understand, you know, better for our audience to understand why, you know, why the focus now, why it's in high demand, you know, going from something that was stagnant and 
we didn't really think about to, okay, we really have to start looking at ramping that up. And like you said, putting, you know, that manufacturing, the peanut butter and the jelly, you know, in-house and combining it so we can have the best sandwich in the world. So I like that. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so next question is, uh, according to the manufacturers, the uh, top four critical occupations in semiconductor sec uh, se in the semiconductor section um, are operator, uh, technician, engineer, and software engineer. Um, what would training look like for these occupations and how would someone get started? So now yeah. as, you know, wanting to get your perspective as an educator in this space, um, how, how, what is your answer for that? Yeah, so the great thing about working in the world of technology is it's it's really a, a ladder type system. You can come in as an operations professional and through the right combination of work experience and education, you can work your way up that ladder to really be an influential technology leader at any of our semiconductor corporations. So if you're if you're a young person or you're looking to transition from a different industry, you can come into the semiconductor world, work as an operator uh, with with some uh, foundational technology training, maybe an associate's degree uh, and some on the job training. We're currently working on asynchronous upskilling training. Uh, so, so you, you can really come in and, and enter that field from a lot of different angles. And as you migrate up, uh, if you want to be an engineer uh, or a, a programmer who's really developing the, the underlying uh, schematics and building the machines that make the semiconductors, uh, then you're probably looking at that, that engineering training, maybe a four year degree uh, that, that can be in physics, electrical engineering, material science, uh, or you can come in with perhaps a, a degree in mechanical engineering and then leverage that foundational training with on the job training and upskilling that introduces you to that world of uh, uh, semiconductor language and culture, uh, which, you know, under all of our uh, engineering and manufacturing professions, there are core fundamental principles that can be leveraged regardless of your background. So if you're a mechanical engineer, manufacturing engineer, if you have a degree in physics or mathematics, or even if you're coming in and you know your, your education might not be in engineering, maybe you're coming with a chemistry degree or biology degree for that matter, we can often leverage a lot of those foundational scientific and technical skills to, to upskill you into these positions. Now, the great thing about the world of semiconductor manufacturing and engineering is it, it, it doesn't end there. If you, if you wanna be a scientist, if you wanna do research, we have those opportunities. You can partner with the University of Minnesota or other great institutions. And if you wanna go into management, if you wanna go into production, sales, marketing, this, this ecosystem really encompasses all of those professions, which foundationally serve uh, Minnesota and the nation's economic security in this space. Thank you. And I actually think you answered my next question because uh, what I was gonna ask next is if someone uh, was starting as an operator, what would their career pathway look like to get to technicians and engineering and engineers? I think that that's, you know, um, as someone in, that's part of the workforce development ecosystem myself, that's the things that I, that one of the things that I think about is how to keep uh, an individual moving along um, and, you know, progressing in that pathway. But you did answer that, you know, starting out as an operator and looking at, at you know, four year degrees and getting to the technicians and the engineering. So, so thank you. You know, before we get to the next question, is there anything that you wanted to add on about career pathways from operators to technicians or engineers? Yeah, so, so in the world of semiconductor manufacturing, that, that pathway is long, robust, and there's no shortage of professionals that want to help, uh, help, you know, grow their, their workforce. But what I will say is, regardless of where you're contributing to the semiconductor ecosystem, it is A, a critical role, we need the operators, and B, the semiconductor space pays very well regardless of what role you are uh, specializing in. So we're all on the same team, we're all working towards that same mission, and everybody is going to be compensated in a way that's going to help them live the American dream. Good, I like that. All right, so um, many manufacturers feel there aren't enough skilled workers. Um, you know, as an educator in this space, do you agree? Um, you know, what are the challenges that require collaboration from companies, education institutions, and other workforce uh, entities to resolve this. So where I'm getting at is, you know, I'm a, a firm believer that, you know, to make workforce development work and be successful, everyone needs to meet in the middle. So that is the employers, the educators, the, you know, government, um, you know, deed representing government, um, other, you know, workforce resources that are available out there. 
everyone needs to meet in the middle. Um, you know, since we're talking about analogies, you know, I love the, your peanut butter and jelly analogy. I always think of it as, you know, a, if a table and each group represent a leg, a, a leg of the table, a four legged table. If one is short, shorter than the other, if one is skinnier and not as sturdy, you know, the table is not going to be firm. It's not going to be a strong table. Um, and, and so this is the same with, you know, workforce development. All, all of the parties need to meet in the middle and really put some skin, skin in the game to make this work. So one, once again, you know, what, what are the challenges that you think that's going to require, okay, everyone needs to collaborate, everyone needs to work together to resolve this um, issue of not enough skilled workers? Yeah. So, so the really good news is that right now, Minnesota has an unemployment rate, I think like 2.5%, something unbelievably yeah. ridiculous. So yes. that's, that's great news, uh, especially for our, our, you know, our, our, our professionals working across the state. Uh, the downside is, is, as you say, our resources of human capital are strained really, really tight. And that really makes it hard for our, our semiconductor manufacturers in the greater economy to continue to grow, continue to be competitive and to lead the nation. So from where I sit in higher education, what I would advocate for and what we've seen success with is bringing those employers together and one, uh, using their professionals to help us inspire that next generation of professionals. If I can get an engineer from Polar Semiconductor to come speak to my uh, classes, give guest lectures, do field trips to these semiconductor fabs, that's a great tangible way for our students uh, to feel empowered to pursue these careers. And what often goes underappreciated is so many of those young people, especially on the left side of the socioeconomic bell curve, the idea of working at a place like Polar Semiconductor and building semiconductors is almost intangible, unimaginable, because it's outside of what they know in their everyday experiences. So by empowering these young people to see that these are realities, by lowering the barrier uh, to education in the state, that's huge. And I, I think recently the state of Minnesota has really appreciated that and is, is going a long ways towards that. Uh, the other side of that coin is taking folks that might be working in industries that uh, are, are contracting or being replaced by newer technologies. So how do we how do we take those workers and reskill them, upskill them, and get them speaking the language of semiconductor manufacturing? Well, that's another great place where the Technological Leadership Institute indeed comes in, saying, hey, not only can we give you the new skills, allow you to speak that language, but likely give you a pay bump. That's somewhere where we can can really work together to, to serve the common need. And then if, if I were to say a coin has a, th a third side, maybe the, the kind of the rough part around the edges, it's how do we continue to communicate as a community, as a state, that there are humans across the country and the planet that want to come here and want to work. So we, you were talking about, um, you know, focusing on youth and, and you had mentioned youth and, and reaching out. Um, so the next generation of workers, we all know are going to be more racially and ethnically diverse um than today's workforce and work for, and of course you know uh the workforce of the past so this means that manufacturing like all other industries will need to tap into groups that may not have been previously targeted for recruitment so in 2021 the manufacturing labor force in minnesota was 83 percent white non-hispanic or latino and 52 percent male uh, manufa uh, manufacturers, educational institutions, and other organizations, you know, are working together or starting to work together to provide an entry into the manufacturing industry for youth, um, from Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities, so from BIPOC communities and other diverse backgrounds. So er everywhere from K through 12 to post-secondary education, you know, what are your thoughts on how educators can prepare and engage the future workforce for this industry? Yeah, so so I think culturally, we as Americans often think that that these big questions can be turned around in 12 months, 24 months on election cycles. We, we can fix everything. I, I really think the reality is with this tapestry of Minnesota and tapestry of America that we need to empower to, to help serve in these different technical capacities, we're looking at a generational conversation. So I, I look at uh, 3M did a great job back in the 50s and 60s where they, they expanded their manufacturing footprint across the region. So they went into these communities that may have been socioeconomically less prosperous, let's say, than the metropolitan area, and they empowered and 
and gave these um, community members opportunities to grow in their professions while simultaneously allowing people on that uh, left side of that socioeconomic bell curve the visibility that, wow, these are opportunities. It's not just a something I see on TV. You know, when you watch PBS and you see that white guy in a lab or that white the, the guy in a white lab coat, um, it's not just TV. That's reality. That can be that can be anybody. So I, I think one way of having that conversation is saying, look, this is going to be a 10 or 20 year process to, to really achieve that high return on investment. So how do we reach these communities? Now, the good news is um, so many of these uh, communities that we want to uh, empower and, and continue to bring into the fold aren't necessarily in uh, far, uh, far flung parts of the, the state, though there are definitely uh, folks out there, but we can do a lot of good here regionally and uh, make sure that we have transportation uh, uh, resources and Minnesota has been investing in that greatly, making sure we have uh, child care services and Minnesota has been investing. Uh, so then the, the, final, the final, I guess, nugget of that thought process is how do we ensure that folks in these other communities that, that haven't maybe prospered uh, uniformly with the growth these corporations can do so. Well, I think that's you know part-time employment that's making sure that we are able to take advantage of the human capital while simultaneously understanding that these are people and people have kids, they have other obligations and we cannot be successful as an industry, as a community, as a nation, if we aren't working hand in hand to know that our, our organizations, our industry is only going to be as successful as our community members. In order to do that, we have to understand that it's a multi-variable equation. We've got kids, we've got education, we've got to make sure that there's that visibility. So I, I think Minnesota is doing a great job and I look forward to helping you know continue that over the generation because that's what it takes. Yes, and we are excited that you your passion about this um, you know about this industry about outreach to um, you know your thoughts on outreach to BIPOC communities as someone from the BIPOC community myself. Um, and you hit the nail on the head. I mean, it it, it it's you know there's that saying Rome wasn't built in a day. Neither is this, but it's it's moving forward. It's continuing. It's acknowledging that. Um, more outreach, more career exploration, more opportunities need to be shared with those uh, communities, with the BIPOC communities, with other underrepresented communities. And that could be, um, you know, uh, the disability community, it could be second chance workforce. You know, there are individuals in those communities that can be just as successful in a in the manu in the manufacturing industry in a manufacturing career than you know just like everyone else. So um, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so we, we we talked a little bit, or you mentioned a little bit about AI. So um, I want to ask you this question. Um, so I think if I have this right, so the process of creating semiconductors involves taking like thin uh, cilian slices or called wafers. And spending months getting them like engraved and printed is that correct yeah yeah, yeah. so okay. typically silicon but there are other types um okay. and there's chemical and uh, optical and technical processes that are basically applied to these uh semiconductor silicon wafers uh and then through that magic uh, they become microchips or tiny little microelectrical machines or other types of components that make our cell phones computers and cars work okay so so from the research that I did, but you know, prior to this 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 interview, um, doing this requires the use of AI or some use of AI. So you know, as you know, there's been talk about the dangers of relying too much on AI. Um, in your opinion, um, can semi can the can semiconductors be manufactured without the overuse of AI or you know just AI in general? You know, it, it, how you know for for this manufacturing and producing semiconductors in the future. Where does AI fit into this? What is going to be their role? Is it going to be a bigger role, a small role? You know, um, can we control the level of, you know, need for AI in manufacturing this? Like, what are your your thoughts on that? Well, I did just watch the Terminator, so I feel pretty comfortable speaking about this. Um, but uh, that said, so uh, semiconductor manufacturing over the last 40 or 50 years now has been able to grow and become as successful as it is in large part because of automation. So we, we've been building robots into the process for a very long time, and it's been great. So artificial intelligence sitting on top of the existing automation processes will hopefully in the near term, let's say five to 12 years, allow us to drive down um, uh, failure rates, increase production rates, increase the speed of production, identify 
uh, areas where uh, we can improve efficiencies. So I, I think we'll see a lot of, you know, and a lot is relative, but we'll definitely see movement in making our processes here more competitive. The better AI that we have embedded into these systems, the more competitive our manufacturing is going to be, which is going to be good for our economy and our employers and our uh, professionals working. Uh, in the long run, uh, do I see, um, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger's robot, you know, running and building um, semiconductors all by himself so that my, you know, you, you put Arnold in one end and you get a semiconductor in your cell phone out the other end? I don't think we're going to get there. I think uh, what we've seen over the last century is that as we put more technology into manufacturing, uh, we don't we don't necessarily decrease uh, the amount of human capital we need to make it successful. But what we do is we translate the type of training, education, experience our team members need to help us continue to, to grow that technology and make it more successful. So I, uh, on the whole, uh, I have a very optimistic outlook on how artificial intelligence helps our local and national semiconductor manufacturers grow and be more competitive. Okay, so two things from that. One, not to be afraid of AI, but embrace it. Um, it's not going to get to, like you said, you know, <laughs> we're in the future, we're going to have Terminator-like robots uh, running everywhere. And two, now you make me want to watch Terminator again. That's one of my favorite yeah. movies. So now I'm going to have that on my list. <laughs> before this weekend, I'll watch it again. So thank you. <laughs> um, so two more questions before, before we're done. Um, uh, what, what is the future for the semiconductor industry in Minnesota? Yeah, so if I if I were a king for a day, uh, what I would see is one, the continued growth, sustainability, and success of our existing semiconductor ecosystem. And that includes everybody from the, the folks making the, the actual diodes and microchips of Polar Semiconductor and Honeywell, to the folks making micro electromechanical systems, little actuators uh, such as Collins. I, I wanna see the continued growth of the folks that integrate these uh, small technologies into larger systems. So the circuit board manufacturers, Benchmark Electronics, there's a lot of circuit board manufacturing, both in Rochester and Winona, they're a great corporation, uh, and see that these companies are growing and are sustained. On top of that, my second order wish is that we really become that beacon for the upper Midwest and the nation and you know the world, to be honest, that brings in people that want to work, want to live, and want to contribute and be part of our global economy here in Minnesota, because there's no better place to do it. Uh, we are beautiful. We have the, the best higher education. Uh, we've got the best jobs. We've got, you know, Lake Superior in the lakes, uh, and we have Minnesota Deed helping us lead the way. So I want to see that be the reality for, for not only myself, but my kids and hopefully their kids. All right. And so last question before we end, what else do you want the audience to know about the semiconductor industry in Minnesota? Your thoughts? Uh, what you like, what you don't like, where you see it going, where you want it to go, you know, what are just, what else, what else do you want the audience to know? So the first thing I want the audience to know is that semiconductor engineering, design, and manufacturing is imperative for Minnesota and the nation's economic and national security. Having uh, that competency and capability is something we need to continue to grow as a nation and to be successful throughout the 21st century. Very important. The second thing I want your audience to know, and this, this really harkens back to, uh, you know, how do we ensure that everybody can contribute to this really cool pipeline? And that's, I want everybody who sees this to talk to their kids, talk to their nephews, nieces, anybody who, who is trying to figure out what they wanna be in life, what they wanna do in life, and let them know that anybody, uh, given the education, the drive, can work and contribute in the semiconductor world. It's really cool. It's a great culture, it's a great community. And it might be intimidating when you watch PBS, you see the guy in the white lab coat talking about, you know, how do we build the next quantum computer? But the reality is those people that are building it are no different than you and me and the folks that are um, around us. And that's Minnesota. And that's how we make, you know, the technology of tomorrow. And with that, we are at the end of the interview. I'd like to thank the audience. Once again, thank you, Travis. And you guys have a good rest of your day, rest of your week, rest of your month. Until next time. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye.